Are we joined right now by Mike Russo? He is the CEO of the National Institute for Industry and Career Advancement. Uh, Mike, glad to have you. Uh, give me 10 seconds. We are focused on making sure strategic industry sectors have what they need to continue to in innovate. Our major focus is, is really the development of the nation's talent pipeline to support those sectors. So think of tech-based industries and advanced manufacturing and the supply chain needed to support them, You know, broadening that supply chain. So that's really our main focus. Yeah, it's so interesting, the problems in finding, you know, we we're in this wonderful era right now where we've had super, super low unemployment. And yet the weakest sector for employment has been the strongest sector for the last 10 or 20 years in general, which is technology. Yeah, that's true. Well, if you think of the proliferation of technology and, and just how it's growing and expanding, I mean, you can imagine it's sort of naturally that you're going to need a workforce. But if you think of what's been happening through the education system, both from a K-12 preparedness for STEM-related fields, whether it's interests or whatever, as well as the rising cost of college, right? It's You, you could understand why there'd be an imbalance there. Well, you don't so, have to tell me. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got three going to college next year, another one in the, in the pipeline. And it is, it's also interesting how you get um, the, uh, the mixed levels of outcomes, right? You have a lot of colleges that are very expensive, but the people come out of there with degrees that don't have the value that the same degree might have from an elite institution. And, and then, of course, you've got so many people who aren't getting that opportunity uh, to, to get a, an elite um, four-year post-high uh, school education. And yet the, the jobs in the tech industry, I feel like that's right where your sweet spot of getting workers ready to work in tech. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and I think you hit the nail right on the head there is that A, there's a shortage of talent. B, there's fewer people that can pursue those types of degrees, right? Uh, and then how do you how do you make sense of that? So that's really uh, the foundational element, one of the foundational elements of our strategy. So what we're really working on, we also have the National Center for Skills-Based Learning within the Institute. So what we're really focused on is leveraging the existing K-12 system, career and technical education, community college system, but also importantly, registered apprenticeships designed for those industries so people can actually pursue those careers without having that degree. Sure, they can go back and get the degree to go up the ladder, but that's really a, a foundational pillar of our strategy, getting more people into the pipeline without having to write the big check. So to really be that fulcrum point from, say, a high school education to a job working on some level at a semiconductor fab and maybe moving on from that. Absolutely. So, for example, we're a part of the strategies. We're, we're uh, throughout the nation starting, we call it our gateway apprenticeship program. It's GAP. But basically, it's a pre-apprenticeship program. So, as we uh, roll that out to the career technical education centers around the country, students that graduate from those career technical education programs in high school will have already checked some of the foundational boxes they need to pursue those careers. And through our infrastructure, National Talent Hub, by the way, is something you should look at on, on our website. But through that infrastructure, they can transition seamlessly right into those careers and already have some of those skills needed. And if they do that through a registered apprenticeship, which, which we sponsor, uh, they're able to actually start further up that ladder and, and take get credit for what they've already learned, be of value to the employer more quickly, and also uh, really focus on filling the gaps that they might have, not have to relearn things. I think about this sometimes when I talk to people who are in the military and trying to imagine transition from the military into uh, a, a domestic uh, life and, and, and corporate life and, and thinking about those skill sets that came from uh, skills learned in the military while those might translate. What are the skill sets you're talking about that people might have that would translate with a little bit of education into tech that people don't know are tech skills? Yeah, that's a very good point. So it's another uh, pillar. So we, we were working on, you think about diversity, more people in the, in the system. I mentioned K-12, everybody goes to school. So there's diversity built right in, broaden the pipeline. Returning service members is one of the three other pillars. Those folks that come out of the military, hydraulics, pneumatics, statistics, process control, problem solving, troubleshooting, leadership skills, showing up on time. I mean- Showing they, up on time. Yeah, I mean- they're, On this, time is late. That's a skill. <laughs> You laugh, but it's true. They're, 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 so they bring really some strong foundational skills. The challenge was initially when we were uh, looking at it is that the MOS is the you know, different branches of the service have different MOS as they're called. And, and we were trying to figure out how to map that. 
we ended up coming up with in our system, a national town hub doesn't make any difference where you've acquired the skill set. You can come in, establish a profile in that system. It will read where you came from, what you know, and match you to the current. It's a dynamic system, the current needs of industry. It also aligns curriculum from all, of, all the various providers of training and education. It in real time, it's a dynamic system, aligns training. So think about Three, think about the, the veteran or the individual, the adult looking to map a career or education. Think about the employer with the job requirements and think about the whoever provides the training it, in real time uh, aligns them. So those veterans come out, they, instead of getting ghosted because they don't have five years of specific advanced manufacturing right. skill, they actually can leverage it and get respect for what they have learned and go right into those programs. So how does, uh, I want to talk about the CHIPS Act and I want to talk about AI. Let's start with CHIPS Act. How does the, what is it, $50 billion going into um, uh, to encourage semiconductor companies to build plants in America um, uh, through all kinds of tax breaks and incentives and, and R&D credits and so on. Uh, how does the CHIPS Act and the construction of, of fabrication facilities in the United States change the game for what you're doing? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I, on one note, it's, it's really powerful and really good that the U.S. has that form of industrial policy and funding behind it. So it's a kind of an awakening from a nation perspective. Really good. It's an important, very strategic industry sector, as I'm sure you know. The flip side of that is whenever you offer funding, people come out of the woodwork to submit proposals, fund me, fund me, I'll develop this, I will do that. So inherently, you have a fragmentation of uh, efforts and People oftentimes will offer to develop something that may have already been developed. Like we're, already, we're, we're a 501c3. We've developed what we have with federal funding. We're the nation's, uh, the U.S. Department of Labor's national intermediary for re- innovative competency based registered apprenticeships for, for um, semiconductor nanotech sector supply chain, right? That's all funded. So those funds should be spent in the same area, right? Same regions, but to deploy, not develop. So it's really interesting. There's a this awakening, funding being spent. By the way, it's really not that much. You say 52 billion, 52,000 million. Whoa, right? Let me tell you, 39 billion, that goes out the door to build fabs. Then the, then the remaining 13 billion or whatever is research and workforce. Everybody's supposed to have re- uh, workforce pr- uh, part of their proposals. It's really not that much money. We absolutely are combating fragmentation and helping regions to know how to best deploy and not develop. But it's very interesting. Very interesting. A good problem to have, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, it's it's, it's a good thing to get our workers ready for the next generation. And and, uh, it's here. Um, And AI is here, too. And I think that um, we see so many um, uh, second derivative, third derivative impacts of, of AI uh, and I wonder in terms of the uh, entry-level workforce, because I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. What does AI mean for entry-level workers uh, and preparing them for jobs to work in AI? Yeah, I would say entry-level technicians of all levels, even lower-level engineers, let's say technicians. So it's a really interesting uh, dynamic because if you think about uh, artificial intelligence, and by the way, if you ask 10 people about their definition of art, artificial intelligence, you probably get 10 different definitions, right? But if you just think about it conceptually, there's no doubt over time there will be uh, some of the existing workforce will be replaced because of artificial intelligence and what, what those capabilities are. But there's also additional jobs that will be created because of, our, it's almost like when you went to automated fabs, you, you people say to you, build an automated fab, there goes all the people that used to run the carts around with the wafers. Now it's all on a track. No, you still have 3,000 workers, 2,000 are technicians. They're just deployed differently. So I think that there's uh, the foundational translational skills that are needed across technicians in, in advanced manufacturing and tech. That foundation will remain. It's some of the other skills. Think of the little bit higher level skills or differentiators that uh, we'll need to prepare the workforce in. So I think there'll be a shifting in the workforce. We need to realize what's going to be going away and realize what we need to focus on. But importantly, which is, again, a pillar of our strategy, make sure there's, that we build those uh, broad, fa- uh, broad population with those foundational translational skills. I think the other there flip was, side of yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no please. I was going to say the flip side of artificial intelligence is really how will it impact education, right? Think about rural communities or people that don't have access to this classroom. And you think about 
how 3D is already levered, uh, being leveraged in, in training and education, right? Put you right in, right in with whatever you're working on or the application that you're building or deploying. Think about what artificial intelligence can do also. So there's really two sides to the AI coin the way I look at. Uh, um, what do you think of the, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal uh, I read it online. I started to read it online on Monday. Didn't finish it. The, the, the physical paper came out on Tuesday. I did finish it. Um, uh, but it, it was an interesting piece about people. Um, uh, it started with sort of ch- how to change your resume and make it look ready for AI. But then it started with kind of training and 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 talking about getting sort of the necessary tools and and stating your past experiences uh, as if they were AI experiences or the AI um, uh, worthy. Um, credits and the things that people have done in the past. And I wonder what you thought of that, uh, that piece of that idea of recasting your resume in terms of AI. Um, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, that's like chasing, you know, chasing the, uh, chasing the, the, the cat around the yard. Right. Um, I think that uh, being able to convey that you have those strong foundational skills required across all any form of tech. Now you were talking about technician. This is, this is our focus, right? Not, not design right. and engineering, right? Um, um, making, sh- if you can articulate that you have those strong foundational skills that can be applied to AI, I think that is more practical, especially as we're in an era where we're even defining AI, right? Um, so I, I'm not going to di- agree or disagree w- with, with the article. You know, I'm not going to go there. But I do think some, there is something to be said for really having those strong foundational skills and being able to articulate them in a way that they apply to the tech sector, whether it be semiconductor, whether it be biomanufacturing, nano, you know, any form of nanotechnology, et cetera, because they will apply to NI or excuse me, AI. Let me let me ask you. Lastly, um, wh- what is the biggest change you think in, in the ability of people to use AI? to both train themselves and get themselves, uh, uh, get themselves ready and their, and their presentation of their work ready or the, of their careers ready to work in AI? Yeah, so uh, in, in the, pre- the presentation, piece, can, can you imagine how someone will be able to go in front of a screen, make their presentation, make their pitch, develop their application, you know, via, you know, online, and then have AI take it and refine it and play it back to you and how you can tweak that and get it ready for, you know, showtime, right? Um, I, it's interesting when you see, you see now about how some of the applications that they're talking about, uh, you know, you don't even know who you're talking to anymore. When you hear somebody online, did they really say it, right? Geez, that's, that's got, has to be them. You know, it looks just like them. Well, that same technology can be used when you're developing your presentation, your presentation skills, as well as if you're developing design or applications, et cetera. I think the sky's the limit. I mean, I think it's really going to be endless moving forward on how you can refine what you present, whether it be operationally, whether it be from a design or from an education or an actual presentation, right? It's it's a fascinating time to enter into tech absolutely it's a, absolutely uh it's so it's so it, i think it's uh uh it, it's just moving so so quickly and and actually <laughs> ai is at the point where it's actually improving itself as quick as quickly as we can sit here and talk about it right i don't know how you keep up with that and that's another reason why it doesn't make sense to try to keep your resume up with it right make sure you have those strong skills and the attributes needed to succeed in that new world He's Mike Russo, the CEO of the National Institute for Industry and Career Advancement. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Great talk to you.